Welcome everybody to our webinar series, Exchange Experiences with Distance Teaching. My name is Barbara. I'm a research associate at the Institute of Managing Sustainability at Vienna University of Economics and Business. And I will guide you through this webinar session today. In our first webinar today, we want you to gain insights into methods, tools, didactics, and share our experiences, how we interactively trained 120 students in four days with six trainers using two different collaboration tools. Before we start, I want to point out that we will record this webinar. As we got several requests, especially from people from the USA that cannot participate due to time reasons. If you want to participate in the webinar, but you don't want to be seen, please switch off your camera. If you want to participate and you have a major issue with the recording in general, please contact me via the private chat and we will edit the webinar in the post-production respectively. Anyway, we will contact all participants with a GDPR form in the post-production of this webinar. We are happy that so many experts followed our invitation and today's participants come from four different continents and 12 different nations from all over the world. Before I will introduce today's speakers, let me say some introductory word, words why um, we conduct this webinar. Corona will hopefully pass, but distance teaching and home learning will stay and gain increasing importance in the near future. Many universities quickly and successfully shifted to court their courses to distance teaching. But now it's time to take stock and exchange experiences and start co-creating the university of the future. We are coordinating the EU-funded project Living Innovation. And within this project, we provide a vibrant expert forum for sharing insights, for exchanging of best practices and effective knowledge transfer. Some rules for today. Um, please use the chat function for questions anytime. I will try to summarize uh, the questions and we will come back to them later. Please mute yourself unless you speak and please switch on your camera when I, when the moderator addresses you. Before we jump into the topic, let's, let me ask a short introductory questions to all of you. Please post in the chat forum a number and a sentence on the two questions. Do you have experience with distance teaching? Zero, you, N not so much. You mainly want to learn in this webinar or 100, you mainly want to share your experience. And the second question, what would you want to learn and share in today's session? So please take one minute, think about the two questions and put a number and one short sentence in the chat box so that we have the chance to get a deeper understanding of today's audience. Okay. So some first experiences with distance teaching. A lot of people that want to learn even more. Also some experts in the group.
Okay, also participants want to share. We will consider your inputs for um, the planning of our future webinars. So if you are ready to share experiences, we are happy to be a platform for this also. Some more comments? If not, thank you for your answers and contributions, um, which gives us a deeper understanding, as I said, and we will come back um, to these comments in our future, for our future webinar planning. Good. We now start with, we will now start with our expert inputs. Please feel free to ask questions to every session via the chat. We will have another half an hour at the end of the webinar for the questions and answers, as you can see in the schedule. I'm, I want to introduce today's speakers. One of the most outstanding points of our students' course was that the students were facilitated by a team of six professionals coming from industry, radio, design thinking, and academia. The trainer's team was multidisciplinary. Andre, who, was, who has many years of academic experience in designing experience-based learning setting within our university, Heike, who loves to map impacts and who is a responsible innovation expert. Lydia, a co-creation and innovation specialist coming from Artos, bringing in the industry perspective. Angelo, a former um, radio expert and storytelling specialist. Ursula, who has successfully facilitated many, many design thinking and participation processes and myself, having worked in a strategic design consultancy for nearly 10 years. I'm now handing over to André, who gives us the background to the university and the respective course we are sharing our learnings about today. Good morning, everybody. I think before we go into the details on how we did it and what we did, the question is, what is the context and where did you do that? Actually, it was a virtual event, but it has to be understood on the, in the background of our organization. We all work at VU Vienna, which is the Vienna University of Economics and Business. It's nice, so this is not a design chart. It really looks like that. So this is from our campus uh, and it's huge. Uh, it's Europe's largest business school with about 25,000 students and about 1,500 members faculty. We run at VU two bachelor programs, one in business economics and social sciences. So this is everything you need to know how to make money. And the other one is business law. This is everything that you need when you have to respect law in making money. So everybody's about making money here. And there is a compulsory course on sustainable economics and business about social entrepreneurship, CSR, so corporate social responsibility, responsibility, and all of that stuff, circular economy, you might name it. And this is a compulsory course for all bachelor students. So this means that all bachelor students have to take this course. And as you could imagine, this is quite a huge number of students. There are a lot of parallel courses in this compulsory course so that we don't squeeze all of these 1,000 students into one lecture room. Uh, there are a lot of parallel courses. So the course that we are explaining today is a course which is uh, designed for about 30 students per course. It's experience-based learning. We've run this course now for many, many years. And we do not just run one, we run four in parallel. Uh, the course itself uh, has the aim to foster an understanding of different perspectives because sustainable economics and business means also to have different views on the same matter. We do not apply any multiple choice tests, and this is quite different to what most of lectures in our university and bachelor levels do. And we also want to steer creativity and collaboration in these courses. 
So how does it work? So the standard course structure is there's a kickoff meeting of two hours with an introductory lecture, there's a thematic training of two hours, there's a research training of two hours and a scientific writing training of two hours. So there are eight hours of direct contact with students normally. They have three kind of homeworks. They read journal papers and draw, draw a mind map. They do a short, they conduct a short literature research and they develop a literature list and they read one scientific paper in detail and they develop a comprehensive summary. So this is the kind of opening, this is what happens and then in every semester by now we had a two full days of business simulation, role play, challenges and so on. So the core of this course is these two days. And this also was the challenge of this semester of COVID and of, uh, of distance learning, how to organize uh, two full days of experiential learning uh, while we're sitting in front of the computer. So what does it mean experiential learning? These two full days are based on the principles of don't tell them, let, let them experience it. So we do not perceive ourselves as the teachers, much more as the trainers. Uh, we stage their experiences, we steer them through the process, we give them room for reflection, but we do not um, give any kind of presentation during these two days, not long presentations, not kind of academic presentations. So we just want to nudge them to do something and to experience something. And we've done that these two full days for many years now. And the main challenge was how can this be done on a virtual base? So how did we do it? We packed these uh, two full days uh, into three tracks. Uh, so this means uh, we then had 20 students per track. We cut the tracks into four sessions, which means each session is about three hours long. We used GoToMeeting for the larger groups. We used Mural and Klaxoon for co-creation. And Lydia and Ursula will give you some brief insights into these two platforms, Mural and Klaxoon, because we think they are marvelous collaboration uh, platforms. And you will have even some kind of short recordings that we'll show you today. We used OneDrive to share documents. And we also have some small group work of groups of four or five students. They were self-organized and we did not provide any platform for them, um, not using Zoom or anything like that. We told them to use WhatsApp, telephone, Skype, whatever they would like to do because in total we had these two days 60 students and we had these two days twice so this means in total two rounds of in total 120 students so 60 students Monday Tuesday and other 60 students Thursday Wednesday cut into three tracks cut into four sessions and this is what we will show you today so who will show you what uh, there will be Heike talking about impact how to analyze impacts in these kind of virtual sets. There will be Lydia and Ursula telling you about co-creation. I will tell you a little bit about how to do consulting stuff with uh, the students and a specific format, which is called Pechakucha, Pchakcha. I was told in, in Japanese it's called Pchakcha. So you, it's a little bit different to practice. And then Angelo will talk about fact check. So this is what we plan today. You will have five brief introductions into what we did. While we give these introductions, while we give this summary, please feel free to ask any question into the chat forum. Uh, Barbara, do you want to have a few more words on what to do and what, how we will treat the questions? Or did I already tell everything? Yeah, please put your questions in the chat and we will have half an hour uh, at the end and I will summarize your questions and we will come back to them later. I can see um, the, the provision of the slides is one question at the moment. So yes, we will have this also at the end. Heike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara. First of all, um, welcome from my side as well. I will present um, the session that I do, did over the four days in total. Um, so what was um, special about this um, session that we actually, or that I actually did? So um, basically um, what we did is um, that we kind of um, taught the students, as Andre already mentioned, impact mapping. This is quite of a complex um, method um, that the students can learn. And uh, we use though a quite standard didactical, like quite standard didactical tools um, with that. 
in combination though with cloud services um, and shared documents basically. Um, and I will go into more detail what that was then. And um, as you can see, um, this quite worked quite well. Um, the students had very good experiences with it. They um, it really emphasized that the learning by doing was really good for them. So um, how did we do this um, then um, in the end? So um, we had a basic challenge in the beginning. And as Andre already told you before, we had the students um, separated in different kind of groups where they were not in the main room in the go-to meeting. So they had to work kind of independently um, from us and therefore needed extra orientation and kind of guidance from our side. And that's uh, where exactly um, these like shared documents and templates then in the end came in. But uh, first of all, let's come to what standard way of um, teaching we used in the end. Um, basically, we had an um, introduction um, presentation um, that was in the beginning to teach um, the students the method of impact mapping or like when you do it, any kind of other like rather complex me method of theory that you want to do. We then explained to them the tasks that they had to do. There were in total three tasks for them and then also introduced the template that I will go into uh, more detail later on. And then they had to like go separately into um, their different kind of like groups and work on the different tasks and then um, like work on that, present that and um, later on um, I gave them feedback. And we did this two more times uh, within um, this time frame. So they um, went to their group work, worked on the task, got feedback and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, um, that was the basic structure. So basically um, something that you would also do in a face-to-face -face session. But as um, I said before, we had this challenge of um, have giving them orientation why they're away in, not in the go-to meeting, but working in WhatsApp or whatever they used. So how did this look like then in particular? And so, um, as I said before, we had um, three hour sessions that were in like complete or in total three hours long. And out of those three hours, we used um, 20 to around 30 minutes for the input presentation, for really teaching the students um, in a concise way what this method was about, that they could relate to it later on and that they really had in the back of their minds. And um, what I want to point out here as well is that we already in the presentation use kind of visuals and color schemes that the students then could remember in their group work. That was one of like the really like crucial parts that you have to remember. So don't put too much like, like text on the slides, but really use colors and visuals in a smart way so that they um, can relate to it later on. And we then also explained the task to them, the template that we created before the session to them for that. And um, as I said before, we used um, cloud services for that. Um, and as you can see in the next slide, we, um, and as Audrey already said, we used OneDrive, which was pretty um, user-friendly and practical, but you can also use like Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever fits for you um, best. Um, we used OneDrive, but it's just um, our best solution. But we had pretty good experiences with that. So when we explained the task to the students and also the template, um, we had like separate kind of folders set up in OneDrive for them so that we also wouldn't run the risk that they would um, delete um, the slide, the template that they prepared of each other so that they really had one link to one folder per group so that they could work in there either like at the same time working in um, OneDrive or download it and then upload the slide again to their uh, or the template again to their folder but that they really had their own room basically and as you can see here we had the template on there also some additional information but that is not that important so how did this, did this template then look like um, as you can see we have some like core elements um, in there first of all like some information uh, that they had to put in that we later on could also um, relate it to who or which group did what. And then, um, as I mentioned before, um, in the presentation as well, we had kind of at the top um, right corner, a visual reminder of the core basic uh, structure of the method so that they could also relate to when they're working in the groups to how did this look like and how 
uh, was this working. And there is then also like this connection to the colors as well, that they can see, okay, um, I have to do for this um, task, I have to do um, this part of the method and fill the template in with that. So then here you can see, okay, activity, a brighter green, that is under task one, then I have to do that under task one. And then it's one more time also like for task two and task three, that they really can see what they have to do. And it's again also separated visually. It's just a small thing, but it really is important that the lines are also bold that they can see, oh, this is task one. So I have to work on that right now. And then also for further orientation, we gave them um, a short description of the task because we um, told it to them, of course, in the presentation before or when we explained the task, but <clears throat> sometimes they just need a reminder for that. Give them the structure of how they had to fill it in, as you can see with the activity one and then activity dot, dot, dot. And then also like a, an example, a concrete example, which could then um, be as well, um, for example, when they had to work in the food industry, then um, the example could be in the clothing industry, something similar, but not the same. And in the end, um, as you can see, um, the templates were all filled out quite well. They really not only brought quantity, but quality. And within um, the amount of time that they had available, it was quite impressive what they could do within this complex uh, method in the end. Um, yeah, and um, then what are our recommendations? As I told you before, um, focus on um, the input and theory presentation that is read easy to understand and also give them the basic knowledge that they can refer to later on. Key though is the template. Um, really work with visuals, colors and kind of mirror this like user or student experience. So what steps do they go through for each task and try to support that with the color schemes, with the visuals as well as you saw in the template. One more thing, test the template before um, you go um, and put it on the one uh, or before you give the access to the students because they use different devices and maybe they cannot like open it for a device and then you're kind of like have the problem of um, like one student not being able to open it and stuff like that. Um, so really focus on that too. And a final recommendation um, in order to avoid that the students are active and that they don't drift off in a wrong direction, keep these um, the regular presentation and feedback um, cycles because then they kind of have a little bit of the pressure to do something and to something qualitative if you give them feedback as well and they can also learn from each other. Yeah, and that's um, from my side. Uh, thanks so much. And yeah, questions are later on then. Thank you, Heike, for your input. As this is, um... As we have very short time and this is quite far, this was quite fast. I invite everyone again, please put questions in the chat box so, so that we can come back to them later. I will give now the moderator to Lydia and she will talk about the co-creation online session. Okay, can you hear me well? And you can see my slides. Okay, very good. So, good morning. Um, let me see here. Okay. So, while uh, Ursula later on will uh, focus more on the creativity aspect of co-creation, I will briefly describe how the workshop is organized because Although it may seem contradictory, co-creation cannot just be improvised, especially when working with groups. We need to have an established process, although um, flexible, I will come back to this later. This does not mean that everything should be revealed in advance to the participants because the surprise effect is crucial to provoke co-creation and co-creative thinking. What is important is that participants book a certain time in their agenda. They know if there will be breaks or what different moments there will be activities in the workshop, but they don't need to know all the details. Um, as the time we had was quite short, we kindly asked participants to uh, get prepared. So we sent in advance uh, material related to the topic so that they could read before the workshop. 
So I mentioned the flexibility. Uh, it's very important to be listening all the time and maybe readjust the agenda in function of the group dynamics. And here comes also the idea of having two facilitators. It's really helpful to be Barbara and me listening and sharing the role of facilitator. This is very shortly how we get pe people prepared to, uh, to collaboration with some recommendations. I will not go through all of them, but mainly uh, it's a question of listening, of respecting the others, of not judging, and uh, especially respecting timings. This is very important. And also it's good to remind participants uh, that their role is so important. We remind them the importance of their contributions, why they are there. And we insist on the co-creation aspect because it brings together different minds, different backgrounds. Uh, it's a diversity of people and this is really enriching. So about the methodology um, to build our agenda, we more or less focus um, uh, we follow this double diamond uh, process, which is inspired by the design thinking approach, um, which alternates different uh, divergent and convergent techniques, starting with an established challenge to, that guides the process towards uh, addressing uh, solutions that address this challenge. There is a different uh, divergent phase where participants explore the context, bring all facts and figures, uh, what is the current state of affairs, and then they also empathize and explore and start focusing on the definition of a personal profile. And additionally, they are encouraged to reflect on what is responsible innovation and related principles, such as sustainability, uh, risk anticipation, and so on. So then they converge to a common contextual map, uh, a persona uh, definition, and a set of systemic questions uh, to uh, consider responsible innovation. And with this in mind, usually this is a, a visual representation such as a map. Uh, usually it's uh, hanged on the walls, but here in the virtual workshop, we had this on the board so they could consult at any time. And um, then we have uh, all this, we can step into, again, a divergent mode uh, where a participant can throw their ideas without limitations. And finally, they are asked to filter and select and formulate a solution. So in general, the divergent activities are done with the whole group, so we can uh, gather as much as input as possible. And then the convergent activities are done in smaller groups, uh, four to six participants, as uh, Heike explained, they go and they have their own ways to collaborate uh, through different uh, tools that they have uh, chosen in advance. So here you see very quickly the agenda, it's very light, we, we don't show much. And uh, what is important with establishing the challenge is that um, it should be clear, and but uh, not too focused because we want to keep it open to ideas, and but not too vague, so that we have a concrete, uh, we can obtain concrete outcomes. So now I will show you how it works, the examples. So this is the background for the conceptual map <clears throat> to inspire participants with some starting points. And here you can see how they use uh, the Klaxoon application with the different colors to uh, provide inputs to the different uh, dimensions of the conceptual map. And at the end, they keep this map uh, on their board and they can consult it at any time. Uh, for the persona, this is done in a smaller group. So we gave them a template <clears throat> where they can uh, define, give a name to the persona, an age, uh, what this persona does in her daily life, uh, and also focus on the pains and gains, which are uh, the starting points to find a solution for them. So here is an example of how this has been completed for a person that they called uh, Duke. And uh, for the ideation uh, part, part uh, here I have a very short uh, video of how we use Klaxoon to uh, maybe change the colors of the different post-it uh, uh, to be able to cluster them in some way 
And this is a different visualization where we have some categorizations. We can categorize the posit according to their uh, specificity. And also uh, with the colors, we can filter them. And this helps with the, then later uh, selecting them, prioritizing them, and uh, uh, select for the solution they want to work on. And for the solution, we proposed another template where they can uh, describe uh, the what, the how, the who, and also answer to those uh, systemic questions or so reflect on the responsible innovation of the solution. And uh, there they have like three minutes to pitch this solution with, on which uh, the small group has worked together. So all, uh, every, everything is shared among all participants. And um, this is the way they have completed it. They could uh, even uh, include pictures or they had uh, a free time to, to describe the solution. And um, well, that's on my side. I understand if you have questions, we will be able to answer them later on. So I pass the floor again to Barbara. Thank you, Lydia. I will hand over the moderator. Just a second. And would invite Andre now to talk about his session on consulting. Okay, so my session was uh, focusing on how would you, well, imagine you're a consultant. And we're doing this as a role play in life settings now for many, many years, because we think asking a student not to give an academic presentation, but to think about how his ideas or her ideas could be pitched to a client, push, uh, pulls them, pu pushes them into a situation which is quite realistic uh, for many of them when they finish studying at our university. So many of them go into the consulting sector. And so this kind of role play setting was the background. The main question was, could it work, this kind of role play setting also on such a kind of virtual and distant teaching environment? So what we did first is I gave a short intro into the basics and the challenges of consulting. So this was a kind of 15 minute input. I also asked them for their understanding of consulting. I asked them to write into the chat forum how they would explain the daily life of a consultant to their 12 year old nephew. So this was, uh, on purpose in a way to talk about what is really happening in consulting and not to talk this kind of artificial academic language. Then I explained to them that consulting is a professional knowledge-based service, what makes a consulting company unique and so on. And their first task was then in groups of four to found, to imagine, to found their own company and to develop a consulting offer. This was building up on the work they've done before we went into these two days. So as I told you before, they developed a mind map, they did literature research, they read and summarized the scientific paper. And based on this background knowledge, they put together, they combined their knowledge as a group and they developed two to three service offers. They discussed the benefits, uh, I gave them individual support if needed via go to meeting, and then we had a brief discussion of progress. This was first round. Second round, uh, they were confronted with a client. So this is a chocolate manufacturer, a vegetable, frozen vegetable manufacturer and footwear. And their next task was to analyze the needs of these very concrete companies and to design a very concrete offer based on what they've done before. So to read the sustainability reports of these companies, to consider the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and to decide about what they would like to offer. Um, again, 30 minutes and a brief discussion of progress. And then in the third round, they had the task to develop a 12 slide pitch to pitch their offer to the respective company. And we were using a method which is called uh, pchakcha. So I was told this is the Japanese pronunciation pchakcha. If you don't know how to pronounce it, many people call it pechakucha. Uh, and pechakucha, I think it's also easier for me, uh, is a kind of automatized PowerPoint presentation where each slide just has 20 seconds. 
this gives a lot of stress to people, so you need to rehearsal it. Uh, Pachakcha was developed in Japan by designers and architects who were simply fed up with boring presentations of, I would say, academics. Uh, and uh, just having 20 seconds per slide prevents you to put a lot of bullet points on the slide as I'm doing it here right now. Uh, so the students had to prepare slides uh, of just 20 seconds per slide. Uh, they were giving these presentations. During the presentations, the students were asked to take the role of clients. And then there was a question to the audience. As you imagine you are a CEO or top manager of this company, what came to your mind while you were listening to this presentation? And this kind of feedback, what came to your mind, this kind of role taking was done into the chat. And then there was a final round of feedback uh, from me as a trainer. So what were the benefits of Pechacucha? Well, it's vivid because of pictures. You cannot put a lot of bullet points on the, on the slides. Uh, it forces students to give presentations right to the point. It's high and it's very energetic because of the automatic timer. So adrenaline is everywhere. Um, it's close to reality in consulting. It works perfectly well with distance learning. And if you want to know more about Pachakcha, uh, in under this YouTube link that we will share and you will get the slides of our presentations as well. This is a Pachakcha, how to develop great Pachakchas. So that's a meta Pachakcha. And students also have this link so they could uh, easily understand what it's about. What were the limitations? Compared to the real life settings, the changing roles from consultants to clients did not really work well. In the real life setting, we had more time. We had more time for them to prepare also as being clients. This fast shift, they did not make it. So they stuck to the loyalty to the presenter. So there were no challenging questions from the clients. They were super friendly in their feedback. So sometimes I had to play the devil's advocate and I got the impression three hours, a little bit too demanding for all of that. So perhaps four hours a little bit longer would be better. That's from my side. So thank you for the next one. Thank you, Andre. I will give the moderator to Ursula. Mm -hmm. Ursula, the floor is yours. Online co-creation, the second. Thank you very much. Just see if the okay. I just need to make my slide. We have tried that before. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's my part now to talk again about being creative in an online session. So basically, I used uh, the same tool or the same method that Lydia and Barbara used. I used design thinking, but I did it in a slightly different way. And I would like to uh, focus my presentation now on two issues. The first one is how can you make people become creative, especially in an online session? And the other part is uh, how can you support groups online when they work online, in, when they work in small groups? Uh, the first part, how to become creative. I believe it is extremely important nowadays that people become creative because creativity is the basis for innovation. And innovation is a key to solve our nowadays problems, be it sustainable development challenges or other challenges. And I also believe, and that's the, the basis for my work. Okay, sorry, the slide is not moving now. No, it goes. Um, that I still believe that our education system focuses a little too much on knowledge piling and building instead of the creative use of knowledge. So I'm not saying that knowledge is not important, but I'm saying that uh, the right combination of all the knowledge people have is important to become creative and to solve problems. Um, so creativity is for some of the students quite an unusual thing to do. And I take some time at the start to make them become more relaxed and to make them allow their own creativity. So some people don't believe that they are um, creative. So I want to, yeah, I want them to take it easier for this session. So I'm using design, design thinking, as I already said. Design thinking is a tool, is a method, but it's also a mindset. So when I teach them, I focus on this mindset. Um, people should be, when they work with design thinking, should be open, curious, positive. They should allow new thoughts and ideas, and they should not criticize or judge. So I try to repeat that several times because I think it's not 
it's not the normal content of, of lectures at business universities to talk about that. Um, and then I want to, to try, I want them to trust that they are creative. So I don't think everybody believes that they are creative and they don't believe that they are allowed to use it in a lecture. So this is uh, one important part for me to make them relax and just do it. And I also say that for this session that I'm doing, they don't get a mark for the results, but they get their mark for being involved and being active and taking part in the exercises. So that makes take away some stress. Um, what I do as a warm up, for example, to make them creative is to ask a really, really, really simple question and then just tell them, just do it. Just try to answer this question. And in order to show that, I want to show how we did that on Mural. I used the platform Mural, which is um, yeah one other platform for common for working together. I'm just trying to change to the movie. Um, I'm sorry, just a second. Okay, it did, it did work when we tried it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to switch now. Okay, I have to do it this way. And this is the first picture. And what I do is that I make them draw things. Let me know if you see the movie. Is it okay? Not yet. Okay, sorry. I can change that again. So I'm trying it again now. Oh yeah, the movie should start in a second. What can you do with a circle was the question. And ask them to draw whatever they can think of one can make with a circle or do out of a circle. Sometimes it takes a few seconds until they get started, but then once they do, they really enjoy it. So this is one example of a warm-up session to make them step into this creativity mode, into intuition. And I need to make this other one big again. I come back to my slides in a second. Okay, I think it should be my slides again. Right, this is for becoming creative. And then they also split in small groups, like Lydia did that. And I found it quite challenging at the start to co to cooperate with the small groups. Normally in a classroom, I go from table to table and then I assist them at any time they need something. With the groups, it was a little bit more difficult uh, because the mural platform is only a writing or drawing platform. And they were in their chats, in their own chats within the groups. And I was in the big chat room so I was I tried to be there all the time and tried to okay I'm trying to step in my slide um, I tried to step from group to group and uh, support them there and I always offered to be to come to me to the big chat but I also went from group to group online which is possible in Murem and I could watch them what they were doing and I also would, would write something in inside their own uh, paper where they were working uh, right then. I also found out that working with the groups the exact schedule is very important but also to be flexible if necessary and the clear exercise we had that before I think all the, the lecturers said that yeah and be there if anybody needs anything be it technical problem or something with the content or they don't know what they need to do right now. And I would also say plan plan some breaks where you can be flexible. If a session needs more time, then you have a shorter break or the other way around. This is something I learned from, from this work. And last but not least, um, for doing a prototype, for like um, creating their, their ideas, I use the technique which is called storyboard, 
And I give you a short insight in how this storyboard works. I still need to change to my to one last short video so that you can get an impression of how that works, which is this one, and I still need to share it with you. Just a second. Okay, I think you can see them moving. So it's a session that took about 30 minutes and you can see it in a couple of seconds now that they were all together in the group. They were doing drawings, they were putting text to it and they had this little storyboard explaining their idea, which worked really well after the three hours of being creative creative and putting the knowledge together at the same time so this is basically from my side what i experienced and i'm yeah happy to look at your questions later on thank you thank you Ursula. we come to our last speaker it's angelo on fact check yeah, so a lot of that we have learned so far, and there's one session that is coming up next. It's called Fact Check and Storytelling. So as you see, there was a broad variety of courses that we presented to our students. And um, if we could skip to the next slide, please. Um, in this session, the focus was on sustainable development. A topic that quickly makes you look um, like a know-it-all and that's why we wanted to choose a new approach and as a method we used humor and there we focused on late night comedy we took John Oliver as a best practice example and uh, talked about food waste John Oliver um, is a late night comedy format uh, in a, a form of investigative journalism um, who has won a lot of prizes and has millions of viewers all around the world. So there were three hours of time for the students to write um, a storyline, a comedy script, um, as Sean Oliver does it in his show. And the students we are having here haven't done anything like this before. They don't write scripts as normally in their and academic. Um, so we structured the process into three steps to walk them through this procedure. At first, they had to identify the key messages that uh, John Oliver is presenting in his video. We watched the video together and uh, spoke what they have identified, and therefore we used a Canva like Heike has presented it before. Um, so that they know exactly what to do and where to fill it in. Um, the second step was to transfer these facts to Austria. Um, they, we gave them some uh, background in research, how to do it. Um, we spoke with them about the common approaches, the check, recheck, double check, for example, and to rely on reliable sources. And then in the third step, they had to develop their own storyline. Between these steps, there was also a short session where we sum up what they have learned so far. Um, we did it all old school in a work that was shared on OneDrive. And this gave me the opportunity to observe what they are doing and to give them feedback in their Word document um, when they are going in a way that we don't like to have them. So we focused here on storytelling um, to connect the facts that they have researched for Austria to a story. Because when you tell a story, you invoke a power that is greater than the sum of the facts that you report. And here, as we have mentioned before, the chat was a secret star and I tried to establish the culture in this session that they are um, coming up with all the ideas they are generating and they have in the chat all the time. During the group work, um, there was a slide on uh, GoToMeeting with a summary of what they have to do. So it was um, my 
approach to tell them very explicit what they have to do, but to give them the feeling that they are free in the creative. And so it was a mixture of the Canva, where they know exactly what to do, and the freedom of their creativity. And then when they have developed their story, there was an option, not a must have, to add humor to it. Um, and there are two possibilities. On the one hand, you can make them laugh, thereby you generate greater attention and have better learning effects and a positive group spirit, or you try to make them be funny. And that was our approach. So I was pretty serious in this uh, lecture. I didn't make uh, any funny um, statements. Um, I tried to make them be funny. And that has uh, the positive impact that it boosts their creativity. They have to understand what they are talking about to be able to develop punchlines and it clarifies their views. So that's about humor and sustainability and storytelling in short. Okay, Angelo, thank you very much. So and we had these five different slots so you might now ask what about the outcomes what about the impacts so first of all the immediate outcome was very positive because this is what our students said uh, we asked them first immediately after each day and at the end of the course and we have a standard evaluation form at the vu uh, where they can fill in what they liked or disliked and we were quite happy that they some of them said this has been really uh, how quickly the day passed by it was never boring cool online tools the brainstorming led to really good ideas so the feedback the quality feedback was really outstandingly good um i think also we learned a lot beyond this course we see that students like to interact with trainers and teachers using virtual platforms not just because they don't have to go to university so I, I still remember one of one student writing into the chat forum when i asked them in the in the morning how are you and one student wrote nine o'clock still in bed however i'm taking the course now this is the future uh, so being independently from the place from the location i think that's quite nice in addition i think we are closer to them uh, we are much closer when we talk into a video camera than we would ever be in a lecture room. So in a lecture room, we are five meters, 10 meters, 15 meters away. We are so close when we look into the camera and they feel this closeness. Also when they use the earphones. So we speak to them much closer. We use a kind of visual style that they're used to. So when they grow up with YouTube influencers, as a matter of fact, we behave a little bit like that. We tell them and write this into the chat, write into the chat right now. This I see this all of the time. 20 year old influencers telling me where I should write something into a chat. So we have to, you have to accommodate, adapt to that. You have to do it in a similar way. Otherwise you don't get any questions into the chat as we did not get a lot of questions from you right now. So we have to motivate you as well. Quantitative results. In our, uh, in our evaluation forums, they felt adequately supported online, which I think is outstanding. Uh, they said the overall, they learned a lot in this course and overall very satisfied. Uh, the satisfaction, sometimes the dissatisfaction, these very small number of students, they were not so satisfied with the workload, um, the workload of the whole course. So for them saying three homeworks to be done before these two days and then the eight hours uh, in front of the computer, some of them said that's too much. Uh, this was because we in the beginning planned to go with them in a live setting, even outside Vienna, and they reserved these two days. We could not rearrange that. If we would stick to online courses, we would say not more than four hours, not eight hours a day. That, that's too much. This is what we learned. We also learned that from our end as trainers, uh, going in and out to the different courses virtually, uh, I have to say that's really nice to sneak into the courses of the others, to go into the other virtual rooms, to see what's happening there, then to go out, then to go in. Um, I never experienced this in live settings. I like that a lot. Our learnings. 
virtual experiential learning is possible but not so much in a role play style the role play style that they really behave they really act out to my impression did not work so much it's not necessary but if you build on this kind of acting out and role play um, it does not really work in the virtual setting um, the cross-disciplinary team created to our impression, to the impression of our students, a quite diversified and motivating experience. So these different slots, different people, different backgrounds, they liked it. Uh, we got the impression that the outcomes of the co-creation sessions were really, really highly creative. So this was not just playing around with co-creation, this was doing co-creation. Uh, the preparation is key for the success of such a two days program, preparing the platform, preparing the drive where you store things, preparing the canvas, preparing the slides. This is not stand up. This is, has to be well prepared because having 60 students a whole day, if you end up with technical problems, you end up with chaos. Uh, the small organized, small group work worked better than expected, although we told them if you collaborate in groups of five, in some of the sessions we told them do it as you like, do it by Skype, do it by WhatsApp, call each other. We do not provide the platform for your small group work. This also sort of pressure from our shoulders. We weren't responsible for all of these interactions. We did not send them into Zoom subgroups. We said, okay, uh, if we would have this uh, class somewhere, you also have to find your way to the classroom. So you find your way to your colleagues. So this was quite okay. So this was from the broader view. So I think it's up to questions and answers. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Um, as we have quite many um, high class experts in this participants list. I invite everyone again, please ask questions um, to the speeches or in, on distance teaching in general in the chat box. In the meanwhile, I will address um, the questions. Ursula? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that I could address one of the questions I saw in the chat, which okay. uh, is for me. Uh, there was the question from Hank who asked, who, who, who did you do, where did you do the circles? This is, was on the Mural platform, and the Mural, Mural platform offers like um, online whiteboards. It offers blank sheets, but it also offers a huge number of, of already filled in forms, like Lydia also presented in different style. And I did the circles with a blank form, and I just drew circles on it, on them, and then let them draw. This one wants to add. Hank, are there any. Um further questions to Ursula on this topic. We also invite you to um, turn off your turn on your camera and unmute yourself if you wish. I just saw the question, which are the advantages and disadvantages of Mural versus Klexum? Which one do you prefer? That's a, an interesting question because I used uh, Mural and Lydia and Barbara used Klexum. So we we don't know the other platforms that well. Oh, well, I, I can maybe answer a little bit uh, from my, I don't have a large experience with Mural, but I have been using it as well. Uh, Klaxoon is not free. I saw the, the, the question above, so it's not free. Uh, you have to, to get a license. And for this, it's a little bit more complete. Klaxoon is a whole system that allows you to uh, provide content, so encapsulated content with video, with courses, with quiz. And on top of this, it helps with meetings, providing uh, those facilities like for brainstorming or all kinds of surveys or quizzes or uh, tag clouds or any input you can then um, manipulate. And then you have a line, a board, uh, with a, a line of what happened during the workshop. You can also interact with some um, chat. And so at the end, you have a report that is uh, provided by the Klaxoon. So it's a little bit uh, more elaborated than, than Mural. This is, I think, the main difference. But of course, also the difference is that you have to pay for this. Mural, I understand you also have to pay if you, can, you use it for more than 
does the freemium, let's say, version. Um, but uh, at least uh, this kind of uh, facilities is not available anyway in Miral. Mm -hmm. But you can get the test version for some time. And there you can try all the yeah. sheets they have available and you can create different rooms, different sheets, and you can do votings and stuff. So it's, yeah, that's, I think, would say the main difference is, yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. There was a question about exams. Uh, as a matter of fact, our course structure that I presented in the very beginning with the mind map, with the literature list, and with the summary of one academic paper was the basis for uh, the grading. Um, so they got their uh, marks, a kind of basic mark uh, on these three homeworks. And then uh, the, there was no exam based on the two days of ex experiential learning. Uh, the only thing that we said in advance, if you actively participate, uh, you can get a one, a one grade better final mark. If you do not participate at all, you might also get a one grade lower mark. So with a kind of pressure of being active, not acting out, but actively participating. And we did not want to grade their creativity. We did not want to grade their experiential learning. I think one shouldn't do that uh, because then either you have a lot of people showing off, um, but still we said, if you exclude yourself, if you be a kind of silent protester. If this is your spirit, then we are a little bit in trouble. At the end, they were so super actively and so motivated that we said, okay, all of them won grade better than they would have had based on their three homeworks. So we were quite happy with them. They were quite happy with us. Um, if you're more interested into exams and evaluation, um, the U, uh, so the university where we work at, now managed to run large-scale exams with thousands of students on a virtual basis. And there's a very interesting interview with our vice rector uh, for uh, student affairs and teaching, uh, uh, Professor Ramersdorfer, on our website. So if you're more into this exam and evaluation thing, Watch this video. She explains a little bit how they did it, how they managed to run an exam with thousands of students uh, on a virtual basis. Thank you, Andre. There was another question concerning Mural and Klaxoon, concerning technical issues. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in the case of... It? Sorry, in yeah, the case of Klaxoon... I, I didn't... Okay. Uh, just to clarify, I don't mean um, actual technical difficulties. Um, I mean some people, like some people who are less maybe uh, technologically skilled, uh, if they had difficulty using it, um, and you know how how you how you dealt with that, how you helped them. I think, uh, well, technologically speaking, it's not difficult. I, Barbara, you you were there, and I, we had a not. I mean, Klaxon is really. Uh, user friendly. It may lack any, any other things, but it's really user friendly. I've never got, even with other participants that are maybe less uh, na native <laughs> with technology, they were able to use it uh, very easily. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the same. Basically, uh, what I did on purpose is I started with a very, very simple exercise. The first exercise was take a post it, put your name on it and, and write one sentence on it. And with the first exercise, I could see if they all got it, basically. And then everything else, I think it, it happened because people are so used to, to working with these kinds of tools and they helped each other out in the, in the small groups that I noticed too. So it was easy to use. Well, I think there are two things you have to keep in mind when using these virtual whiteboards. First of all, if you prepare something as a trainer, as a facilitator, you have to ensure that your participants do not delete it. So you have to lock it. So if you have this kind of grid or whatever background or canvas or whatever, you have to ensure that nobody deletes it during the exercise. Uh, I think both platforms support this, but you have to take care of that. Uh, otherwise, things get lost. Uh, and there is the other issue that the participants delete some post-its from each other. 
So there's a kind of risk that someone touches the wrong post it and moves it somewhere and then it gets lost. So all of these, these things that you normally have in, in using cloud uh, platforms, you experience the same here. So there's a kind of guidance that you need, uh, but I think there is no big problem in using it. In, in Klaxon, we can establish this. We can establish if we want them to move the background or not, or move the post-it of others or not, or uh, edit the post-its of others or not. So we can change even during the session. So it's 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 something uh, interesting. But I, I see also a reflection here. Uh, Klaxon or, or other, I mean, what you need as a teacher or as a tutor to be uh, aware. Actually, we didn't use only Klaxon. We use Klaxon and go to meeting and the templates and the cloud. And what is maybe difficult is to organize this so there is a smooth transition for the beginning. For example, we uh, teach them to, to divide the screen in two so that they can see both the Klaxon and both the, the go to meeting in parallel. and uh, and this is something, for example, that helps whatever the platform is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, would agree, I would agree on that. And also on the note you wrote that uh, more important is the, the format and how we work and how we encourage the people. And the tools are just tools to, to help to support it. Yeah, I would agree on that. Mm -hmm. I've seen that Andrea Kornheim uh, asked two questions and perhaps we can have a bilateral talk. Andrea, could you perhaps switch on your mic and your video camera if possible? Because I think this, this uh, you asked about Word Cafe, you asked about learn management systems, and perhaps we can have a bilateral chat for a moment. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, uh, I have a, a mic, but I don't mm -hmm. have a camera. So Not uh, necessary. Okay, that's, that's yeah. okay. Uh, you said you experienced um, the the Picha Kucha stuff with a world cafe. I never experienced yeah, like this I, by I now. Could you tell me a little bit more about it? Because I've seen both. I've seen world cafe and Picha Kucha, but I've never seen both combined. What did you experience? Uh, I saw the Pecha Kucha uh, in, in conferences, uh, and it was usually a little bit, uh, of course, the longer version, uh, like pitching. Uh, and after that, so it was a little bit like to attract people uh, to participate in a world cafe that was following the Pecha Kuchas. So I'm, uh, as I mainly saw it this way, I, I was I was interested whether whether this this uh, you did the Pecha Kucha only like this because you also said that the feedback was a little bit tricky for the students so you know it with uh, challenging questions well i'm using pecha kucha now in different courses for many years because i think it's a good alternative if you have something to present which should not be too boring and which should be interesting for other students if it is an academic finding or summary, then Pecha Kucha does not work. But if you present, for, for example, I'm giving PhD courses where students explain their home community. So for example, if someone tells, I'm an ecological economist to others who work in business process management, it's difficult to make them understand from which community you come. And then Pecha Kucha is perfect because you introduce something. If you pitch something, you want to persuade someone, then I think Pecha Kucha is marvelous and you do not need to combine it with World Cafe. And as Pecha Kucha runs perfectly well on PowerPoint with this automatic presentation, it also runs perfectly well using GoToMeeting or Zoom or Teams and PowerPoint and asking them to give a presentation. So that's a perfect link without ne uh, the need for any kind of additional platform. Um, then you asked, did you use a learn management system or only cloud? What do you mean by learn management system? Uh, I thought of something like uh, a Moodle or uh, as we use here on uh, VU, uh, Learn. Uh, nope. But actually like this, uh, this mm -hmm. question was I think almost answered before uh, when your colleague mm -hmm. said uh, that you had to teach students to share the screen. Uh, I thought it might be like a, a possibility just to uh, provide the links to the different tools like Klaxon and World. Uh, but yeah. did you use it or? We used Learn as well um, in uh, for uh, the 
space before these two days, but during the two days we did not use it. Um, but it could be also used. You can also structure these kind of tasks and, and via learn. So as, as Heike said, you can do it via the cloud. You, uh, the, the Klaxoon and Mural, I think you cannot really um, use these functionalities of whiteboard and post-it and co-creation. I think learn does not work on that. But I think there's no, a little bit of no, an insider no. talk because Learn is a VU platform and it's a specifically developed Learn platform of VU for VU. Uh, and I think uh, our friends that attend this webinar beyond VU would not know what we're talking about and could not also make use of it because that's a, that's a VU product. Uh, Moodle is different. Moodle that's quite uh, well known around the world. Uh, I also don't think that it offers similar services as Klaxoon or Mural for co-creation. Yeah, I understand now perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. We also got the technical questions about the recording and the slides. Of course, we will provide them online on the Living Innovation platform after the webinar. Are there some more questions concerning distance teaching and our inputs? If not, um, I want to link again to our living innovation community. We want to invite you to further discuss your experiences on our expert forum on www.living-innovation.net. You all registered for this platform already. So sign in, click to actions and find the discussion forum on the very top. And there we would be happy um, to go on discussing on topics like platforms and systems, digital didactics, interaction and motivation, accessibility and inclusion, and also testing and examination. Andre also referred to our new section on our platform. Um, we have expert interviews on the area of smart home and smart health there, and also on higher education times of COVID-19. Um, Margarete Rammersdorfer, our vice rector, is giving a speech there. So please visit the new section and you can listen to her talk. We are nearly at the end now. Um, I want to invite you warmly to our second scheduled webinar in this series. It will, be, it will uh, take place end of June. There is no fixed date yet, but it will be on humor, sustainability and distance teaching. We were cooperating with experts from Impro Theatre and Stand Up Comedy in another student course of ours, and we will sum up our experiences on that in this second following webinar. So please keep it in mind, end of June, and uh, we will keep you updated um, about the detailed um, date and time. So, we hope that you enjoyed our inputs and we would be very happy if you could give us some feedback via the chat box. So we still stay here in this session. We would be happy to receive your feedback and if there are any questions still open, we stay here and please don't hesitate to ask. There is one question about storytelling. Yeah, that we can answer right here. Um, in the first step, the students have researched the facts um, for Austria and um, collaborated them in the group. And in the second step, um, they got a training in storytelling, how to put them together. And it was not the approach to write a full script. It was enough uh, to write bullet points and say how they would structure it. And the goal was that they tell more than facts, a story they built with the facts that they have researched. If you have further questions, feel free to speak with us.
Regarding the idea of a tryout of Mural and Klaxoon, we thought about that, but we were a little bit afraid that we might then get lost in technical details. Um, Mural has a free uh, version for, I think, 30 days, and it's really easy. So you just have to uh, register to the Mural platform and you can play with it. It's basically uh, some large uh, white papers, and then you just take some uh, virtual post-its and you move it there. You can draw, you can draw arrows and so on. So simply try it out. You do not need to do this in a group. You can do it individually or with a friend of yours or with a colleague of yours. And you will see that it really works very, very easily. And, and, and after a few minutes, uh, you, you see how it works. I think the interesting thing is how to orchestrate the whole experience. So just dragging and dropping and having some, some post, it's okay, that's easy, but, but what's the story behind it? So what's the purpose? And I think we should not forget that our courses and our online stuff, our webinars, they all serve a purpose. So the main question is what should be the outcome? Is it about stock taking? Is it about creativity? And then you need to have different ways how to design it, different ways of how to use platforms. Uh, and we hope that we gave you a broad diversity of impressions, what you could do. If you want to have a deeper dive, let's discuss this on livinginnovation.net.